All right, mate, you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Go! Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquarius Podcast. My special guest today is my good friend, Bill Brewster. He's a reformed lawyer who spent some time running a flooring franchise through the dark days of the housing bust in 2008, 2009, before someone finally gave him the intelligent investor and he became a full-blown value investor, card-carrying member of the Berkshire cult. He runs Sullimar Capital, and he, f- he writes some of the most penetrating, uh, interesting research that I have read, and it's all based on uh, deep research that he does. We're going to talk to him right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Doing well, Toby. How you doing? I'm very well. You have to explain to us how you can be running a flooring franchise through the through the depths of the housing bust in 2008 2009. That's a that's a fair question. I should probably explain it to myself. Um, <laughs> I I was in law school uh, as you had mentioned, and I. I guess a, a curse of being in Chicago and a benefit too. I got really into options uh, studying and trading and whatnot, and uh, learned pretty quickly about like halfway through uh, my first year that I, you know, law school and being a lawyer was not necessarily for me, right? So I, f- I finished the first uh, probably a year and a half in. I talked to my now wife, and I was like, you know, I don't know that I want to do this uh, law thing, and she said, well, you got to finish. And when I finally completed it, right, I passed the bar and I said, all right, well, now what? I've never really wanted to be a lawyer. Um, And I thought that a franchise system would sort of put some barriers or, you know, lend some business expertise uh, to to sort of supplement um, the weaknesses that I had. Um, In retrospect, there were some uh, calculations that I probably could have done a lot better. (laughs) And, and. You know, some of it was timing, some of it was me, uh, but it was not a good marriage. Well, you're you're a, you're a good business analyst, so I'm interested. What? How did you think about that opportunity as you're going into it, and what was wrong with it? Well, so so you know, back in the day, um, the the company that I chose to join has uh, successful franchises around it, right? So they built successful brands. Um, I was looking at, boy, if I can own sort of the flooring equivalent of what they built in other home services, you know, that's going to be fantastic. Um, I I missed a couple really key <laughs> uh, things, and, and that's probably a good lesson in motivated reasoning uh, right there. But, you know, I I'm in Chicago, right? So they're telling me, hey, this is what we think the average marketing spend you know, should be, and, and we know how to own a neighborhood and this and that. Well, I mean, you know, what is, what is a good marketing spend in Omaha is not a good marketing spend in Chicago, right? So, I mean, I misassessed scale. I misassessed my defined market. Uh, I tried to spend too much money on too large of a market, right? I probably should have just tried to own a block with the amount of money that I was trying to do. <laughs> I tried to own neighborhoods. Um, so, Long story short, I think that uh, I learned that there is a different business that the franchisor runs than the franchisee runs, and a lot of a lot of great franchisor brands are built on the marketing dollars of franchisees. So, so now that you're uh, you're a value investor now, and this is I always say this, but value in, is a very broad church. And so, how do you characterize yourself as a value investor? Yeah, sorry, sorry for the alarm. If you can hear that. Uh, anyway, so I, I was saying to you, my uh, when I transitioned out of the the flooring franchise, uh, I was 
fortunate enough to to get a job at BMO Harris Bank uh, in Chicago. I underwrote uh, loans in the in between that time while I was waiting to start because they had credit analyst programs and I had to wait to go into that. Uh, my grandma's friend sent me three books and two were Bogle books and one was The Intelligent Investor. And like, you know, I don't know. I think that guy has a sick sense of humor uh, to do that to me. Uh, I could just be, you know, naively indexing and super happy, I guess. But, right. um, you know, I, it's, um, you know, I, I just think Buffett talks about it. When you read it, it either clicks or it doesn't. Right. So so I'm not a hardcore like quant value guy. Um, I see a lot of merit in that strategy. I think when you're running a research based process, one of the things that's tough about just doing price to book or EV to EBIT or whatever, whatever you want is it takes a long time to dive into an idea. And then let's say it re-rates on you in six months. If you sell it, it's a taxable event. So, you know, in a non-taxable wrapper or in something that doesn't take as much time, I'm a full endorser of that, like like through quant strategies. Uh, I just don't know that for what I'm trying to do, uh, it's the best way to get where I need to go, right? So I, I think I've adopted a little more monger. So you're, you're doing, you're, you're treating them, so you're, you're like more of a, you view yourself as a business owner. You're doing a full analysis of the business, and and I've I watch your Twitter account pretty closely, and you dive into the conference calls and all of the notes as as much as you possibly can. Are you looking at more leveraged companies? Is that what you feel is your sort of uh, that's where your insight is going to be best best applied? Uh, yeah, well, I would say I, I don't steer away from from leverage, which is potentially. Uh, you know, a destructive habit. Uh, that said, I, I just think it's important to keep leverage in context, right? So uh, one one idea that I pitched last year was AB InBev. I know why people don't like that. Um, if everybody liked the idea, I'd argue it's not value, right? But I think it's important to look at debt ladders, to look at the covenant structures, you know, when is the debt maturing? How How hard can they push the debt markets going forward? Um, I like to look at credit default sw- uh, spreads. I like to look at, you know, just sort of how the bonds are trading. I think uh, I have a lot of respect for the credit market. Um, and I, I probably need to learn a little bit more about it to be candid. Let's let's talk about AB InBev a little bit. Um, what was your attraction to it? And how was that? Why was that distinctive to what, what the market was seeing? Well, so I, you know, I have a I wouldn't say an informed variant perception on management, but I do think that with management teams, stock price drives narrative a lot of the time. So if you look back in 2015, 2016, right, these guys could do, do no wrong. They had the 3G virtuous cycle. And, you know, I, I think they probably overpaid for SAB Miller. Their stock price gets hit and now they're morons. And I just think, uh, you know, they have admitted that they miss things. Uh, the world has changed a little bit on them. Beer volumes are declining, but uh, I part of it is they are a management team swimming upstream a little bit. Part of it, I think, is people aren't taking a step back and just like really thinking about the big picture. So AB InBev has almost double the gross margins of their nearest competitors. Their operating margins are are like salivatingly fat. And they have a distribution system that's built out that, you know, I don't know if it quite rivals Coke, but I can't think of too many more envious uh, or enviable distribution systems. So, uh, you know, over the long term, I think that that's a a hand I want to play. And I think beer is a a drink that has been consumed for a long, long time. There's premiumization trends in the – in the you know U.S. and developed worlds and in the developing markets, I think it's a scale game, right? How many minutes do you have to work to get your buzz on? Uh, <laughs> and and if they have such a scale advantage and they can distribute that in front of people, you know they're they're competing with people making alcohol in the bathtub. Uh, you know that <laughs> o- over the long term, that's I, I want to be that uh, product pusher. You don't like the pruno, the the toilet one. <laughs> no, no. And look, I mean, you know, people people have to do what they have to do to 
to escape sometimes, right? But I, I do think that beer offers the occasion to have people do that. And, you know, they're innovating. They've got some, uh, some brews that are not, you know, traditional brews that they can get in front of people that are cheaper. And we'll see. I mean, you know, in five, seven years, maybe people look at me and say, boy, how'd you miss that? And I'll say, I don't know. I was an idiot. Uh, but yeah, I'm willing to put my chips in. Beer's, beer's an interesting uh an interesting business because it seems to be reasonably resistant to the economic cycle. When things get bad, if anything, people drink more. And so they seem to do quite well through those periods. But I remember uh, coming into my screen uh, maybe a year or so ago, Sam Adams, and I'm just blanking a little bit on the name of the on the name of the stock, but I'm pretty sure the tick is Sam. Sam Adams also got unusually cheap. And I, I guess that's all of the... Uh, the premium boutique beers pushing in was that the the sort of the move away from from macro as they call it into micro was that the driver of the of the undervaluation do you think yeah i i think that's probably some of the overhang on a lot of these stocks uh you know i mean so heineken has a i would say a better aggregate brand portfolio right like if you just had to bet straight brands budweiser i mean you're really long lager in the u.s which is under attack but I think what's under I think what's underappreciated is U.S. revenues are maybe I don't know twenty five I think it's twenty eight percent I think is the number but let's call it twenty five to thirty percent of revenues. I mean it's it's ultimately an emerging markets play, uh, and I think that people focus. I, I can't sit here and tell you yeah more assets chasing the same share of throat for lack of a better term is a good thing for the U.S. business, but uh, you know they. I think they're going to manage okay. I don't. I don't think I can drink any more micro beers. I've had enough of the IPAs or the um, <laughs> like the passion fruit flavored beer. I I really just want give me the thing that tastes as close to water as you possibly can. Like just give me the the regular old Bud that'll do me. There you go. Well, Bud Light. It's not even made with uh, corn syrup, right? <laughs> so so let's uh, so they say yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about. Uh, how do you how do you uh, size positions? Um, do you like to stay fully invested? Do you carry cash? How how diversified do you like to be? Do you look at do you look at industry concentration and so on? What, when you're constructing your portfolio or considering a new position, how do you think about those things? Uh, so that's that's a great question. That's something that I'm working through, you know, every day, right? Uh, trying to think through that. Now, if I'm tinkering, that's not very good, right? But I just did performance attribution for myself. Uh, it's not audited. I'm not an RIA. You know, please don't listen to what I'm saying here. That said, um, you know, cash drag has hurt me uh, over time. And I was fortunate, I guess, or smart. I don't know which one, but I deployed a lot of capital from November to January. A lot of it was, you know, late December. And, uh, you know, a lot of it was high beta, if you want to take that approach to it, right? Um, I don't view the world through that lens. So Netflix is something that ended up in my portfolio, uh, which is not a traditional value play. I, I have a little bit of concerns about the business model. But I do think, you know, the I see the world through scale a lot, right? Uh, AB InBev, I, I like cable companies. Um, and I, I do think that over time, the scale advantage on Netflix is something that uh, I'm comfortable betting on. Okay, so now how much am I comfortable with that, right? AB InBev is 10% of what I run. Uh, Netflix is three. So yeah. um, now Netflix is not the reason that my performance has been good, you know, over the last couple months, because it's only three percent, I guess it went up to you know four and a half or whatever. But at cost, you know, I, I'm much more comfortable with the stability of Budweiser's fundamental business and business model than I am Netflix at this stage and valuation. So I just try to think. I mean, I don't think anybody that's long Netflix isn't a little nervous when the earnings call comes out that they're not hitting a growth pocket because if they do it's going to be painful at least you know from a volatility perspective um so i don't you know i would be more inclined to size that position big if fundamentally i thought the story was still together and you know everybody bailed on it because of growth so I, i'm fairly long charter also that's another large position for me 
my view on that was they had an earnings call where they had some integration issues that they had released. And, you know, it was on the back of a, a, a buyback at higher prices and deals that fell through. And, and I think people uh, sort of threw in the towel or, or at least got dejected, right? And I, I pulled up all their old transcripts and I was reading through and uh, they had laid out like, this billing migration is a real risk. It's not a small risk. It's a risk. And here we are, you know, fast forward two and a half, three years, and the billing migration happens. The risk materializes itself and the stock's off huge. And I, I think that, you know, I had lived through an integration at BMO Harris. It was miserable. I bet it's still miserable over there. I mean, trying to get people to change software is like going to the dentist. Everyone complains. Um, and you've got, you know, one organization feels like they're being talked to in a way. Another one thinks that they know every I mean, it's just it's not ideal. Right. So sometimes I think, uh, at least in that case, the financial community models out an M&A integration to go perfectly. And then life happens. And then maybe, you know, somebody's IRR or something gets hit and they say, you know what, I'm done with this. I like to scoop into those situations. But you think because you think ultimately that is a problem that they can solve, that they can get that under control. And when they do, then it's largely back to business as usual. Yeah, well, fundamentally, I mean, what I love about that entity, when you listen to them talk, uh, you know, they talk about how can we keep our, you know, if you think about um, – I'm just trying to think about how to explain it. If you think about a um, a building that's built, right, and it's like 55% full, and you like they just want to keep hammering users into that building, right? So their idea is we're going to charge a, a rent or you know a cable price that's low enough that the competition isn't going to be able to beat us, and we're going to maximize the amount of money per home we pass. And I think that when you get that type of strategy and you get the local scale benefits, you can undercut your competition once the game is sort of won. And I think that where they are combined with John Malone and, and that whole you know team, you know, you can bet against them, but I'll take the other side of that trade. I mean, that was, that was one of John Malone's, I hate to say innovations because it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a reasonably obvious, uh, position now i guess with the benefit of hindsight but he he saw that if he could get scale in tci this is a story in the outsiders he, he saw that if he could get scale in tci then he would have better buying power the infrastructure becomes much cheaper on a per user basis because it costs you the same to put it in the ground however you do it and then the more people you hammer in the better your your metrics start looking is that the is that the is that what chart is trying to do yeah, I think so. And I, and I view Netflix through the same lens, right? I mean, uh, back when you were building out cable pipes, you had free cash flow negative, uh, you know, uh, financial statements, and everybody could look at that and say, what the heck are you doing? Um, you know, you get to 300 million users on a per user basis, you, these content numbers that are eye popping are going to be a lot less eye popping. And they're also going to be really, really hard to compete with. So, you know, but Netflix is rich. I mean, I, I don't think anybody's going to sit here and pitch it as a like true value investment, right? Well, how do you feel about competition from someone like YouTube? So Google's got similar kind of distribution, but the advantage that they have is that people upload this. This gets uploaded to YouTube for free, and this will get dozens of views. And then you know Joe Rogan uploads his <laughs> his for his for free, and that'll get multi millions of uh, of views. But their their content costs are nil. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. And and Joe Rogan's chewing up three hours of your day, right? So that's a fair amount of attention. Um, right. You know, I have uh, – so I personally cut Netflix. I said, you know, I don't like this. I'm, I'm spending all my time searching. What am I doing? And then it took me like a month to resubscribe. Uh, and, and really what got me comfortable with how they understand their business is if you look at – their if forget about the income statement because that's not worth looking at. Look at their cash flow statements, right? I mean, if you look at their cash content spend and their marketing and selling spend, I just aggregate all that and say, okay, well, this is the cost of acquiring a customer and keeping them. They've been remarkably consistent uh, on their 
projected customers, right, or projected subs. Um, if I saw that go way out of whack, I mean, that's sort of my KPI, right? I feel like that's a good indication that they're executing on their plan and they have the long-term view. Um, you know, then I, then I'd have to rethink what I'm what I'm looking at. Uh, and I understand I'm sort of pitching like looking at eyeballs here. It's it's not the the investment I'm trying to hang my career on, but I I see a lot of merit in it. So we'll that's see. The eyeballs, the old dot com metric. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm a little concerned about. <laughs> when you're, but they they are. I mean, to be fair, and I don't mean that as a criticism, but they they every one of their eyeballs is actually a, is a is a subscription. And a fee-paying, subscribing customer, so it's it's real revenue. It's a very, it should be a very good business. That's the, that's exactly the kind of business that you want: subscri- recurring subscription revenue. Um, with you know, they don't have quite fixed costs, but their their costs sort of it doesn't cost them any more for a thousand people to watch than it does for a million people to watch the same the same content run. Yeah, you get some operating leverage out of it, and I would say you know like. The, the real sometimes I think people get carried away with subscriptions, right? The real value in subscriptions is you're locking in your monetization. So like if you look back at when Adobe went subscription or when Microsoft went subscription, their fundamental problems were people would spend like 90 bucks and then they wouldn't buy something for three more years, right? Well, if you can charge them 10 bucks a month and lock them in. It, on a, on the three year example, or, or you know, let's call it two, right? You're turning one hundred eighty dollars into or ninety dollars into what two forty right? That, I mean that's huge, um, and I think that you can make a fair argument that in media, at least the movie business, there's some volatility in ticket sales, right? But if you can collect upfront your subscription, you can sort of reduce some of the. Um, you know, I guess unknowns that are coming with the revenue stream. So I, I think that there's merit in subscriptions actually adding value in that industry. I think that's uh, one of the most interesting insights to come out of the Dollar Shave Club. That they said it's crazy that Gillette charges you so much for each individual razor. We're just going to charge you whatever it is—a dollar or two dollars or five dollars a month. But because you're doing it on a recurring basis and you, you don't necessarily go and buy razors on a regular basis from Gillette, they sort of, you buy them when you, when you think you need to and then you remember, they actually managed to get more money out of people for their spend on razors than Gillette was getting out of them, which is kind of a brilliant insight just by like making it a recurring regular payment. Yeah, I mean, if you looked at my Mach 3 right now, I should change <laughs> the blade, right? But I'm not going to, so... Uh, I should probably be on a subscription model from the business standpoint. So when you're undertaking a valuation, just in general terms, what do you? what's the process that you go through and um, what, do you, what do you sort of – you look for an in, a metric for each individual company or are you, you, you're doing a DCF or how, how do you do it? I, th- I think about what's my – out of the gate now, you know, I just talked about Netflix. So add, add this one back, right? But what's my out of the gate free cash flow yield? Uh, and then I try to compare that among, you know, I mean, I mean, I've sort of borrowed this from Buffett, right? But like, what, what would I get on the 10 year? Right. And then what, what do I think the growth path is? And what do I think returns on incremental capital are? And, uh, you know, that's sort of how I figure out, am I interested in this business? Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other things like my favorite investment that I did was, uh, intrepid potash. That was a price to book thing. Right. And, and it wasn't, a fundamental price to book screen. It's a company that I had known because I banked and uh, they got into perceived distress and it, it was distress, but the um, the company was trading for something stupid like, uh, I mean, maybe a $200 million EV or maybe it might have been even 160, um, but they had just put $550 million of CapEx into this company and it's a mining company. It's everything no one wants. Um, but I was digging through the credit agreements and I realized that farm credit owned a, the needed majority of, uh, voting shares or I guess voting rights. So they could drag along the pensions with whatever the pen, you know, the pensions didn't matter anymore. Right. Farm credit was formed for the purpose of helping farmers and commodity type companies get through down cycles. So I was reasonably confident that they were going to amend their side of the credit agreement. And I knew the bankers at BMO, I didn't know what they were doing, but I think highly of them, especially in the food group. 
Uh, so I just figured, you know, they're going to get this done. It took a lot longer than I thought it was. I mean, there were some, uh, times that I was, I was pretty nervous, but you know, that was, uh, that wasn't very hard to DCF. I just knew if it re-rated close to book, which it should be at least 80% of book given the, the returns on capital that that business should generate that I was going to win. Uh, you know, then it's a matter of how long and do you want to pay the tax? But, uh, I was pretty comfortable with that one. How long ago was that? I think it was 2016, June of 2016 ish. So there were a few companies globally, a few potash companies globally that were in distress about the same time. I remember there was a Canadian and it traded down. It was a net net. And then you got the entire, uh, potash mine, I guess it is for free. And I, yeah. I, I remember seeing that written up on a few different websites. What was the driver of the – so it's, it's fertilizer, so I guess it's demand for, for agriculture that drives, that drives the demand side. Is that the case? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's – potash is really interesting. Uh, it was a cartel. Uh, I, I forget when they, when they uh, broke up. I want to say it was 2010 or 2011. I'm pretty sure it's uh, Belarus and uh, another country. But they, they produced – all the um, potash or could potentially produce all the potash that's needed, right? So because they were a cartel, it was supply restricted. I think that when you look at how long a potash mine takes to, I mean, this is a terrible business, right? But how long it takes to bring a, a mine online. And once you've committed to that capital, you're going to do it. So all these projects were undertaken uh, at, at exactly the wrong time. The cartel breaks up. Everybody starts losing money. Um, you have large exit costs, um, and you know it's a it's a recipe for just irrational behavior for a really long time. And you know I'm not going to call a bottom, but I I think 2016 uh, is a reasonably decent bet at a bottom, and it just happened to you know give an opportunity. So you felt that 550 million dollars in in capital spend was probably a reasonable proxy for what the whole thing was worth. Yeah, yeah, because they were they were digging out these low cost mines, right? So it, it, there's like two parts of the business. Basically, they're geographically advantaged, so they can pump water into uh, lakes and then use the sun to just evaporate the lake and then go scrape uh, the lake and get their potash, which is basically just like salt, right? They had to shut down the part of their business where they were going under the ground and mining. But all the capex was basically spent to improve those lakes and then improve their processing, and I felt like you know that those were reasonably good dollars. That's not like you're not buying a hole in the ground for that. Because that's the thing you're buying a hole in the ground, but not quite. You know, like, literally. What do they yeah. call a mine? A hole in the ground with a liar on top. That's the, the yeah, thing that, that always. That's right. That's right. That's the thing that always makes me most nervous about the uh, mining plays. After you know, you, as a value investor, as a deep value guy in particular, I I don't mind looking at them. But the thing that I'm always most nervous about is at the very peak of this cycle, they've dropped an amazing, you know, a huge amount of money into it. Then is that actually representative of what this thing is worth uh, in the down cycle or over the over the full cycle? And, it's hard to know. I've, I've never really yeah. been able to arrive at the correct answer because, you know, the, the thing that uh, we've been grappling with over the last 20 years is how, w what is China's impact? Is, is China's sort of demand artificial and, and not going to be there in the future? Or is, is this just the way that the world is? Like China's going to have this gigantic demand for basically the super cycle. Remember the super cycle? Oh, I remember. Yeah. Back with the bricks. <laughs> it was going to be awesome. It turned out to be not where did so the, great. Where did the super cycle go? I don't know. I'll tell you what. Uh, AB InBev has brought me down into Brazil a little bit. And it, the bricks are not the bricks anymore. They got to come up with some. I guess we got Fang now, but you know, yeah, th true. those those are probably a lot more sustainable than the bricks. But time will tell on that statement. Um, let's just switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, La Lacroix and National Beverage, which is one of your your favorite positions. Yeah, well, that one. I, I so it, that and Ubiquity uh, sort of rhyme. Uh, LaCroix, I had a lot more personal knowledge with, um, and both of those opportunities came up because of short reports. And that was one of those opportunities where, um, it, a short, there are some corporate governance problems at LaCroix. I mean, there just are, uh, that it's national beverage corporation that said, 
Um, they had a super clean balance sheet and, you know, even if they were paying this entity off to the side, I figured, well, the auditors can, can at least audit cash flow and they can audit debt and there's no debt. And I like, you know, I'm in the Midwest. I just looked around at what was going on with, I mean, they were winning all kinds of end caps at grocery stores and, uh, you know, I thought it was just going to be like this beautiful brand that turned into Coke and I was a young Buffett. Uh, I, there were some other transactions that had occurred by was just taken out by, uh, I'm pretty sure Dr. Pepper, Snapple. And, uh, it just made a lot of sense to me that LaCroix should be worth materially more. Now, you know, we'll see how the story ends up. I, I, uh, was on the Twitter you know, and Mark Cohotis was short and I, I always get nervous when Cohotis is short anything that I like. I was dabbling. I, I exited, but uh, I was dabbling because it had sold off a lot. And, you know, he had seen discounting and, and he uh, he was pressing in his short. I was happy I was out. But it's a good lesson on how quick uh, the world can change on you, because I thought that brand would be there forever. It still may be, but uh, this is quite a hiccup. I like it as uh, a category because I think that there's, I think everybody recognizes that uh, the obesity epidemic, for want of a better word, is probably tied closely to how much sugary water everybody's drinking. And these things offer a, an alternative that has some flavor, although I've, I've seen it described as, uh, it's like it's like watching the, uh, you know, when you flick between channels and you see the what the, the snow on the screen. <laughs> yeah. It's whatever that's called, or it's like, it's like somebody else drinking soda in the room in the room beside you. That's the taste of it. It's like it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't taste good, but I don't mind it actually. I I enjoyed it. I I drink some of it, and it and it it tastes all right. Maybe it's a little bit too. There's too many bubbles in it. Something like that. The next one that comes along is going to be low, low fizz. Well, out there they say that they like Topo Chico, and that's more effervescent than uh than Lacroix. So I don't know. We'll see. Topo- uh, we'll see it. If you go through if you, Texas and other areas like that, Topo Chico is everywhere. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. That's my buddy's out there, and he was from Texas. He, he was like, I don't know, man. Topo Chico is taking off. I said, well, I, I mean, know. I don't know. I hate, to, I hate to use his name in vain, but Chris Cole, he visited me in uh, when I was in Playa Vista. This is in California. And he saw the big boxes of Topo Chico, and he bought some because he couldn't. I don't know if there's some sort of de- supply issue out there, but he's like, you can't get them this cheap. So he bought a whole... <laughs> He bought a pile of them. Just going to wholesale it. One of my one of the fun things about you know investing is in the scuttlebutt that I was doing. Uh, I have a friend that used to be in marketing, and he was telling me that Lacroix would hired a firm to do their advertising, right? And um, they they didn't they knew that they didn't have the scale to compete against Coke in TV. So he said, "All right, what are we going to do?" And they came up with that pop arty can. And I guess rumor has it that they hated the can, but it tested really well. And they were smart enough to say, you know what, if it tests well, you know, let's see how it goes. And and their game was we're going to win on premise conversion. Right. So when you walk by this box, it's going to pop out of the aisle and somebody's going to grab it. And the thing that I like about that, and a lot of people complain that their their OPEX was too low relative to you know sales and what Coke is, but if you have just those colors on the box convey a brand image to you, and it's organic, when you roll out a new flavor, you just flip the colors. And like there's no, if Coke wants to release a lime sugary drink, like they gotta rebrand it Sprite. I mean, there's a ton of money that goes into that. Now, arguably it's more durable. I mean, we'll see. But uh, I, I really like I like the packaging. That was a, a not insignificant part of my thesis combined with Instagram was like, you know, everything. And there's a bunch of social signaling like I'm, you know, drinking LaCroix. So I'm cool. I mean, it was like the perfect storm to blow up. I can never get used to the pronunciation because there was this uh, there's a British TV show that they showed in Australia when I was a kid called Absolutely Fabulous. And the, somebody there's a fashion brand, I think, called LaCroix. And somebody on the show mispronounced it as LaCroix and then there was corrected. Oh, it's LaCroix, <laughs> sweetie. And then that was sampled by uh, like an EDM, electronic dance music group. And so the whole song was just, it's LaCroix, sweetie. 
So I, I can I can't call it Lacroix, but I, I guess I'm doing it. So let's let's talk about ubiquity. What's the what what's the story there, and, and how did you find it? How did you value it? How do you think? Well, about it? that was one that uh, my um, my buddy had told me about. He's out in Silicon Valley. He used to be with the NSA, and you know he's pretty plugged into to that whole uh, I guess community of coders and whatnot. And he was like, "Look, man, I'm just telling you." that every single small business out here uses ubiquity. And, you know, I was like, well, why, why does Cisco not just kill them? And he, he thinks or thought at the time that it was a fundamental organizational principle that Cisco is more enterprise driven and ubiquity's strategy is to get product out cheap, right? So Robert Para is the founder. He's an old Apple guy. And he left and he um, his whole strategy was like rely on the Internet and rely on distributors. So I said, I don't you know, I don't know if I believe this. A short report comes out. I'm reading the short report and uh, I start looking around my house and I realize that my, my wireless network runs on ubiquity. I had paid somebody to come set it up. So I have all these wireless access points. And I just started calling people, you know, starting with the sales guy. I was like, I gave you a fair amount of money. Now you're going to give me some intel, right? Um, and then I just kept asking people for leads. You know, I probably talked to, I'd say six to eight people. Uh, I mean, probably six if I'm really thinking about like real conversations. Um, but I, I just ask them, I'd say, you know, why are you guys selling this product? Right. And, and almost invariably what came back is, it's stable and it's cheap and our customers like it. And, you know, we make money and we don't feel like they're, we're overcharging. And I said, OK, well, why not Cisco? And they were at that point still installing uh, some of the more expensive equipment with Cisco equipment. Um, they've since transitioned. But uh, it, it just got me really interested that, you know, the, the story was we're not marketing. We're B to B to C. And every one of the people that I talked to, like the story checked out. So then, you know, when I looked at that, I mean, there was a short overhang on the stock and I just didn't really buy that. He gave an investor day. People hated it. I loved it. I mean, he's, you know, sometimes people want to have like a, an abnormal result in a normal package. I think when you're looking at a lot of these entrepreneurs, like if they're socially awkward or something, like, I mean, you know, they're not normal, right? I mean, this guy's created a multi-billion dollar company. Like he's not going to be like you or me, probably. Um, I'm but, pretty socially and, awkward, Bill. Yeah, well, you might be the next billionaire. I hope you are, Toby. Uh, <laughs> people would tell me that I'm socially awkward too, and here I sit. So I, I should, uh, but I digress. Anyway. If we're um, talking, well, let's talk about socially awkward. Uh Big Larry Holdings. You went to the uh, oh, annual gosh. meeting. So what's that's, your? That's quite the transition right there. So you're you're not quite. You're not. I know some people who are in the cult. This we both, we both know pivot. someone in the cult. Although, although, although some of the shorts might say they're the same person. Um, yeah, we do know uh, somebody that's in that cult. I, you know, look, I think that Sardar appears to me to be the type of guy that if it's working out, you can look past. And when it's not, uh, he's a crook, right? In people's minds. Um, I talked to Shane Parrish there, uh, and then subsequently at Berkshire, Shane, you know, had that thing called perfectly. Uh, I guess in 2010, he saw some stuff that he didn't like and he, he wrote a letter and, and got out. Um, but, uh, I hope I'm not talking out of school, Shane. Um, but, you know, he's an interesting cat. I mean, he it, it is absolutely true that, you know, there's a guy that stands up and asks a question and says, I've been with you for six years. I believe everybody told me not to believe. I'm starting not to believe. What should I do? Sardar just picks up a peanut, puts it in his mouth and looks at him. He's like, you got to answer that question for yourself. It's like, oh, oh, OK, man, like. This guy is underwater after six years of believing in you. And there, I mean, there's no sympathy in that guy. He doesn't care. I, I don't like the entity because I don't like what's going on at Stake and Shake. And I don't like the debt that they have. Uh, what, what about the comp like the compens for me? I, I followed Sada when he was the Lion Fund at, before I moved to the States. So it's at least 2009, 2008. 
I've kind of been following him to the extent that I could. He was written up in sort of some Texas local newspapers. And this is pre-Stake and Shake. And I thought this guy's a very clever investor and he and he's an activist, so I'm sort of interested in what he's doing. And I followed him all the way up to when he got control at Stake and Shake. And then a few things tweaked me. Uh, selling your signature and branding it under your own name, that's odd behavior, but that's not... If you're a celebrity capital allocator maybe maybe buffett could get away with that buffett would never do it but maybe he would he never do it away. that's the thing right but he could maybe he could get away yeah. with it if he, if he endorses something probably people are going to go and buy it because he's endorsed it but if you're an unknown that's just that's a really unusual move and it needs to be kind of justified in some way and then that uh you know the related party transactions and that insane uh compensation scheme that just makes it, from my perspective, it makes it uninvestable because you don't know, even if he does very well, how much of that flows through to you as a shareholder. Not enough. There's somebody crimping the hose on the way through or there's a hole in the hose. So that's exactly how I think about it too. And then on top of all of that, um, and I, I might not have this right, but I think I do. You're, if you're a shareholder there, your real interest is in the Lion Fund 1, right? And the Lion Fund 2. The Lion Fund 1 might own those Cracker Barrel shares, but it's not, I mean, look, I guess when you're dealing with a controlled company, you don't have that much say anyway, but if that Lion Fund 1 has a 12-year or a 10-year lockup with two-year options or whatever it has, I mean, I don't know what the terms are, but like, you're even further removed from the assets that you think you like, and he's charging, I don't know if it's a 0620 or 0625, I mean... I don't know how much upstate, upside to Steak and Shake and Western Sizzlin and Runoff and Maxim Magazine and you know Cracker Barrel ha- have. I, I hope people in the entity do well, but it's not something that interests me. When he moved into it, though, I thought this is potentially Steak and Shake. Potentially, like I can see Shake Shack is huge, right? Everybody's that's become an extremely popular place. Food's great, great branding, easy to get into. Lots of stuff to like about Shake Shack. Uh, maybe not the price, but. I, I like everything else, but steak and shake. I can see if you're a clever operator, maybe you can get control of that and turn that into a shake shack. And after something that's just been forgotten about for a very long time turns around, starts doing very well. I mean, there's a potentially huge upside in something like that, but that's not the way it's turned out. And for me, that's enough. Well, that's, I mean, that's the value dream, right? You find an, an asset that's been forgotten about by the market and, the narrative switches and it re-rates and then if you can get earnings growth on it, I mean, that's how you get, you know, a hundred bagger. Right. I don't think this is going to be that. I, I, I mean, one of their biggest problems, in my opinion, is Steak and Shake is just, uh, I mean, their financial results are terrible right now and they're going to need to change all that. They think they're going to do it by franchising, but the unit economics on the restaurants aren't working as it is. So how are you going to sell the franchise to somebody? And by the way, you got to roll debt in 18 months. I mean, I've been at banks. I'm. I would not think that the bankers are having a fun conversation right now. But that said, you know. there is a price that if I, I think I do think it's starting to get sort of optically cheap, and there is a price that I could buy it, but probably not where it is. But it'd have to be just like stupid cheap. I'd probably buy some. Well, here's the only problem with that, and the, and and this is where I go back to if it if it was in like an ETF or some tax advantage wrapper. Let's say you buy it. How long is it going to take to re-rate? And then you got to pay tax. Right. So I just, you know, I don't know. That one's tough for me. Well, let's uh, let's let's change gears again. And I don't mean to beat you up about this one, but we did discuss it uh, in real time. So GE, walk oh, us no. through. Oh no, don't do it. <laughs> oh no. I, you know, I think. Uh, look, I, I think GE. When I looked at it, uh, maybe with rose-colored glasses. Well, definitely. You know, I just see. Their their aviation business, their healthcare business, what their power business could have been, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a really good lesson for me to remember. Where, you know, I, I read grants all the time, right? I, I should have called grants and been like, why does Jim hate this entity for twenty years, right? And then, I mean, there's there's a certain amount of hubris that goes into taking any active stock position. But I probably should have listened to a lot of smart, like people that were smarter than me. And, you know, I I joke with my buddy um, who writes under the science of hitting investing. Uh, 
he and I talk a lot. And I'm like, you know, the next time I ever open up a 10K that reads like GEs, I'm just throwing it away. You know, I'm done. And I, I still think on an asset value basis, it's probably cheap. Um, but it's just got an I, ocean of debt, isn't the The debt is the thing that scares me. Yeah, well, it should there. On I mean, new- they're, they're pro- and it's got no cash flow, right? So that's a bad combo. The, the problem for GE probably started somewhere during Jack Welsh's tenure that they could hit those uh, quarterly earnings numbers to the penny. It should have been concerning. That's probably where it started and way, way, way too much debt in there. Even off 90%, if you include the EV, if you include the debt in the, in the, in your in the price you're paying in the EV, it was still bananas expensive. But that's the that's the bias of a deep value guy. But how, how did you see it when it was when it was down? No, I think you're totally right. And uh, you know, I just I, I figure with the certainty the certainty of the uh, cash flows of the aviation business and where that was growing to. I mean, I I think you can make a credible argument that that alone is worth you know eighty to hundred billion dollars. Um, the healthcare business I thought was worth roughly 40 to 50 billion. They, they sold that unit to Danaher for, I don't know, what was it? 24, 28 billion. And I mean, that's not even their healthcare business is not impaired by that. Um, so, you know, you're, you're getting power and GCAS and BHGE, you know, for close to free, which is by hate the worst way to frame something, right? I mean, it's free for a reason. And, you know what I what I also didn't appreciate was how good of the work that that Stephen Tusa has done on that name. Um, you know, I think that it's easy. I think going forward, if if there's a a Wall Street analyst that's like really hammering a company, I need to know probably twice what they're saying against it to take the other side. You know, and I mean, he's just been so right. And he's done the job the right way. So, uh, you know, if this ever gets back to him, good work. Uh, Not that he needs me to tell him. <laughs> Let, let's uh, let's talk about some of the areas that you're hunting now. Um, financials. What what do you like in there, and why why do you why do you like them? Well, I think uh, you know I I like the big money center banks. I I think um, you know from from what I read the uh, the. The community banks and the big ones are probably the winners. Uh, the ones in the middle probably aren't. I'm not, you know, a financial specialist, so you know, do your research elsewhere. But um, I, I think that a lot of people are fighting the last war there. And you know, I look Wells. Uh, it, it sucks to have these headlines come out over and over and over again. The other side is look at how they're performing and how long have these headlines gone on. And, you know, I mean, that bank is a pretty clean bank, relatively speaking. When we used to compete against them, they used to come in with massive hold size, uh, hot sizes. So, you know, if you're putting together a, call it a $50 million facility, you know, we would have a limit that we'd be comfortable at. And it would usually require three banks to come into the facility. Wells would just come take down the whole thing. And then they say, all right, well, with this $50 million commitment, we're going to own all your cash management. We're going to do all your credit cards. We're getting all the ancillaries. That's a really, really tough business to displace over time. So, you know, uh, I, that's one that I that I like. Um, They're very sticky. Everybody's relationship with their, with their bank is incredibly sticky because it's just such a pain to move all of your payments out. You, you receive your salary in there. You move all of your pay- your 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 payments out. It's just it's a nightmare to do. So even with those bad headlines, it doesn't really mean much, I don't think, to the ultimate consumer of those products. Maybe there are some people who are so offended by it that they move their accounts away. But I think that there are a lot more people who said they were offended and planned on moving their accounts away than people who actually did that. And where are you going to move them to? It's not everybody's in basically the same boat. That's right. And I, I think, you know, the Facebook narrative last year can teach you a similar lesson. Uh, what people say and what they do are different. Facebook's an interesting one, though. I, I, I certainly use it very, very rarely. I wonder if their engagement is down a little bit. I don't know anything about it. To the extent that they report, everything is all, all cylinders are firing. So, you know, I, they don't report hourly and stuff like that, right? But as, as far as the user numbers, it's looking pretty strong. So we'll see. Is that like what's the metric there? The daily average user? Yeah, Dow and Mal. 
right? But, you know, like, it's like anything, and I'm sure it's a some sort of Pareto principle, right? Like the uh, 80-20 rule, or, I, I mean, if you looked at some of our Twitter usage, uh, some of us are much more valuable to Twitter than others. Well, I, I have a full-blown Twitter addiction, so I... Yeah, that, that's, I, I, I do too, I do too. <laughs> that's where I spend my time. Uh, let's talk about airlines a little bit because you follow you follow Berkshire very closely. So you're following um, you're following that f- the foray into airlines, but you've got an interesting view on what ultimately happens there. Yeah, well, I I think uh, you know, and I have to credit Phil Ordway for the uh, for the original idea, and he sort of said to me, you know, if you're interested, there's a a book called Glory Lost and Found that the guys, I think Seth Kaplan is his name, the guys at Airline Weekly wrote, um, that is just a phenomenal summary. It's not an easy read, but it's a phenomenal summary of what happened over the last, you know, decade, well, 2000 to 2012. Um, And look, I think bottom line is, it's easy to look at it as a consolidation play, it's a lot of different factors, but the healthier industry uh, has either resulted or other factors have resulted in uh, them capturing a lot of unit economics of the credit cards. And I don't, you know, they're basically credit card companies with wings now. <laughs> so as long as they don't get too stupid and ruin, uh, you know, what they have, I, I think that their their future is a lot brighter than their past. I think it's very funny that everybody talks about them as the consolidation problem in America. I mean, their returns on assets are nothing to uh, gawk at. And on top of that, if you want to see what happens when they're not consolidated, uh, you know, get the taxpayer uh, bailout ready because the, the I mean, I don't know what it was, but 2000 to 2012 or 14 or whenever that last merger happened – it's it's atrocious what that industry does to assets. And today in Europe, I mean, it's just bankruptcy after bankruptcy. So um, the thing I, I love about it is, you know, I, I try, especially being an, uh, you know, a Twitter user as I am, uh, I try to make sure that I don't get addicted to the things that I'm hammering into my head. And to watch Buffett pivot on that, you know, it's just, it's such a, inspiring for lack of a better term like I don't want to be a fanboy but but his ability to flip his mind and say you know what I don't care how many times I stood up and I said this is the worst industry ever or what I you know that I said I have an 800 number that uh (laughs) you know I dial whenever I want to buy one right and he goes out and he buys all of them and and the other thing that I think is sort of interesting is people have said to me well it doesn't take a genius to bet on every, you know, everything in the industry. You could just own an ETF or whatever. He's actually historically had no aversion to making industry bets back when, um, Clinton care was being debated. I mean, he said like one of his biggest mistakes was not buying a bus, a basket of pharma companies. Um, so I think the basket approach is something that I've learned a little bit from studying that move of his. Before he invested in airlines, they all became incredibly cheap. They were, I, my screen was full of them for a period, of, and I was, I, was, I was at the New York Society of Security Analysts uh, giving a presentation there when somebody asked about that, and I think six, huh. six or seven out of 30 positions in my large cap screen were airlines at the time, and they said, you know, would you, would you do it given that you know that Buffett is so anti? And I said, well, I, have to because they're yeah, that's they who are. I am. They're yeah. all cheap, but I, it, um, it always does make me nervous because when I fly, I can see every single plane is absolutely packed to the gills. There's not a seat open on the plane, and I fly pretty regularly. So, and I fly to different parts of the country. So I'm seeing. I think it's a reasonably representative sampling of what's going on. That does make me nervous because it means it's peak. Uh, you know, it's peak yield for the for the seats. Maybe. Maybe uh, oil's cheap, and so this is as good as it's ever going to get. But then I guess the other argument is, well, there's a finite number of slots for these planes to land in, so it's not like it's going to be very hard for any kind of upstart to come in and compete. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think that's, uh, that's largely true, and you know, they can make the planes a little bit bigger, 
I don't know how much more they can densify them. I mean, I, I think they're pretty much at their maximum density. Something that makes me a little nervous is Delta is adding more premium seats. That feels real late cycle to me. They don't think it is, but you know, that's, that's TBD. Um, but you know, I mean, it's look, I, I think, uh, going forward, it, it might be uh, satisfactory. Well, the, the seat density, that that's an interesting... But one of the things that I have noticed, sometimes I'll fly in one direction to to where I'm going and it'll be that you know that configuration where there's three seats on, the, on each side and four seats in the middle. So it's a very big plane. And then on the way back, it'll be that middle row is just not there and it's, the, it's like the six seats across. So I think they're, they're definitely getting the plane right for the, oh, yeah. for the flight because that's that and both both of them are packed so they've just got the they've got it you know they've nailed it yeah well i mean the 737 and the a320 i mean you know they're those are awesome awesome machines and i i you know i think to the to the extent that they continue to standardize their fleets they are not going to capture any of the economics of that right i mean in my view it all gets competed away but it benefits consumers in that it can reduce the cost of flying and then, like, as Buffett likes to say, so, and then what? Well, they're probably going to, you know, expand too much if oil is low. But if it's high, they'll probably pull back on capacity expansion. They've been able to manage through it. I mean, I, I think the overhang currently that exists on the stocks are everybody wants to see what happens in a recession. Right. And that's my biggest fear with Delta is that you know it, it's going to sell off, and my main man Warren is going to come over the top of me with a cash offer and lock in my loss, <laughs> and I'm going to be like, "Oh, great! The so I, I, yeah, I was right, and I lost. You know, look at me." Um, but you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to watch. It, four of them control eighty percent of the seats. We'll see how rational they can be. It's funny if that if that does you know if one of them I don't think one of them goes to I don't think there's a zero in there. I don't think it's a donut, but I heard. There's a there's a great how I built this with Herb Kelleher, which is one of the and they they re yeah. they brought it out again recently when he passed away. Herb Kelleher, who was the CEO, sort of founder, um, creator of Southwest, and he said that the biggest problem in this industry is when one of those one of those companies fails, it's very easy for one of the other businesses to just go and pick up that plane, you know, the asset, fly it onto a route, and like a day later, it's back in service. Yeah, well, there's a reasonable argument to be made that that's why maybe the leasing is a better place to play here, right? Because the the with the advent of the ultra low cost carrier model, there's probably going to be somewhere to move that plane, and who really cares? You know, who? I mean, as long as your credit risk isn't terrible, uh, you're probably going to keep generating some lease revenue. So I, I understand the merit in that. So, Bill, we're we're coming up on time. Um... Just before we go, you're you're a father of three boys, and yes. in homage to uh, the great man. What, what ah, have you yeah. named your, your most recent? <laughs> the so. third is the third is Warren Graham. So uh, if, it's fantastic. Yeah, if anyone's tired of the Buffett talk, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a nice eye roll there. You know, I did it. My wife gets embarrassed about it. Um, I love those guys so much because. They, they're free thinkers. I mean, would I know who they are if they weren't so rich? No, I would not, right? But um, I understand why people knock Buffett. I know that they see some stuff that he does is inconsistent or he gets these sweetheart deals. That dude earned all the sweetheart deals he has and he's not going to sit here and tell you everything he's thinking and he's not going to – I mean life is inherently inconsistent in some ways. So – uh, I just really respect everything that they've given me, and I, I hope my third kid has the uh, the chutzpah to do it his own way, and I hope he's successful. So that's well, why he got the name. Plus, I, Warren G is a great rapper. <laughs> I, I love that quote: "A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of a small mind." I think that's Thomas Jefferson, but I might be wrong about that. Um, yeah. If, yeah, that is a good one. If folks are interested in following you on Twitter, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Bill Brewster SCG, and uh, I write at Sullivan dot group. So uh, there's a, you can always email me through that. We'll we'll put the links to that uh, in the show notes. Uh, it's it's always going to be on the YouTube show notes is the easiest one to find. But you'll find them on. I, I always publish them, push them out through Anchor. I don't know if they necessarily appear on every website, but if you need them, you can always come to acquiresmultiple.com forward slash podcast and all of that. 
uh, all of that content will be there. Um, it's been really fun chatting to you, Bill. Thanks so much for spending the time. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Good seeing you again. Pleasure. All right. Take care.